The next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to name your sins to God. If we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher, and the one who brings to our memory those things we have forgotten. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning these things and give us the concentration necessary to assemble this portion of the Word into our souls. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 10, verse 17. Matthew chapter 10, verse 17. Now we've been doing Matthew verse by verse, and we're up to chapter 10 now. We're flying through it pretty quickly, and uh, I'll be surprised if we have more than 50 lessons on this unless we get stuck on something. And then we'll move on to the Acts. And if you are interested in the uh, Matthew series, we don't have any printed up, but just uh, come and ask uh, me for it or ask my wife, and we'll print out Matthew 1 through 20 for you, I believe, or 21, whichever we're up to now. So Matthew 10, 17 is continuing with uh, our Lord uh, instructing the disciples. And he's telling the disciples how they should act now that uh, shortly they will be given the gift of apostleship. And with the gift of apostleship, they're going to be able to cast out demons. They're going to be able to... Uh, uh, do all sorts of things from that power that they uh, have never had before. Now I said 10:17, but let's skip back to 10:16 because I went through 10:15 last message, and really we need to be in 10:16. Then he tells the disciples this: "I am sending you out like sheep surrounded by wolves, so be wise as serpents." Now, when he says, I am sending you out like sheep surrounded by wolves, the indication from the Greek is, yes, I'm going to do this, but you will still be protected. And God will protect his communicators of doctrine. And as Isaiah said, no, no sword formed against me shall prosper. And that deals with the gift of communication, whether it has to do with the gift of prophet, as they had in the Old Testament, or the gift of apostle, or the gift of pastor-teacher as it is today. It says, no a sword from formed against you will prosper. So the fact that he's sending them out like sheep surrounded by wolves, what he's saying is, this is what's going to occur, but don't worry about it. I'll protect you. So be wise as serpents. Well, he's giving them a condition, and that is they must have wisdom. And the serpent is an ancient symbol for wisdom. And it also indicates that the disciples must have some discernment about people. They must have some discernment from, uh, well, the use of divine power, not their own human personalities. Their own human personalities are going to be helpless against wolves. And just like uh, John the Baptist, he had a type of ascetic personality. He wasn't an ascetic person. He didn't practice asceticism. But his personality was ascetic. In other words, he didn't eat as much as we eat today. And he never touched wine. He never drank wine. He never did these things. Yet he was still called someone who was of Satan. Now our Lord Jesus Christ came to the earth, both eating and drinking wine. And they said he was a glutton and a drunkard. And they also said that uh, he would hang around with prostitutes, which must mean he was sleeping with them. But he wasn't. He was our Lord Jesus Christ. So criticism comes no matter what your personality, if you are giving the word of God correctly. If you compromise the word of God, then you might not receive such hatred. But if you give it straight, and no matter what you do in your lifestyle, if you give the word of God straight, you're going to receive hostility. And this is what our Lord is telling the disciples. He's saying, look, I'm sending you out like sheep that will be surrounded by wolves. What do wolves do to sheep? They eat them. They kill them. 
But what he's saying is, even though you're going to be like a sheep, my sheep, giving the gospel and giving doctrine, I'll protect you. So what you need to do is be wise as serpents. Be wise as a snake, which uh, in the ancient world, that would relate to wisdom or discernment concerning people. Have concernment, uh, discernment concerning people. And don't try to uh, worry about your personality and don't think and don't use gimmicks. And we'll see how uh, he warns them against using gimmicks. In other words, don't use the power of personality. Now, we could. I mean, uh, any of us we might have a good enough personality to stand up behind a pulpit and have a good enough personality to, to win uh, 5,000 people into the church. But personality isn't the issue. The issue is the message. And you'll end up with 5,000 people who will probably still hate you if you give them the correct doctrine. And we'll see this because our Lord later will say, I come with a sword. You thought I came to bring peace. I come with a sword. In 1017, beware of people. And this is referring to religious people. 1017, beware of religious people because they will hand you over to the courts, that is the Sanhedrin, and flog you in their synagogues. Now today, uh, we don't have synagogues. Well, we do, the Jews do, but not very many, especially not around here. You go to New York City, you see a lot of synagogues. But uh, there are very few synagogues today. It's a different time period back then. But what would occur is they would hand you over to the courts, and that would be the Sanhedrin courts and they will flog you in the synagogues. Now that's not very gracious of them, but they would do it because they hate the word of God. They didn't like it. And our Lord is warning the disciples. He's saying, look, you're my disciples. You're my students. You're going to go have to go out and teach the gospel. Now they hated me for doing it, so they're going to hate you for doing it too. And they're going to hand you over to the Sanhedrin, the courts. And they're going to hand you over in the synagogues to be flogged. Now today, uh, you might not get flogged for it because we live in a civilized country, at least for now. It might come to that later down the road. But at least for now, we're civilized enough to where if we don't agree with somebody, we just leave them alone and go out our own business. But uh, in those days, everyone had their noses stuck in everyone else's business. So today it would be more like a tongue lashing or an ostracism. They will ostracize you from social life or uh, give you a tongue lashing and tell you where you're wrong in every uh, sense of the word. So beware of them, them means to have discernment concerning these religious people. And do not be shocked when they attack you. He's preparing them as a drill sergeant prepares his soldiers to go to war. And what does a drill sergeant do when he prepares the soldiers? He chews them out. Well, he gets right up in their face and calls them everything, uh, everything in the book that's not nice. Now, it might not be the best way to train people, but that's what they do. And they do it because they want you to be prepared for battle. Because when you're in battle, it's going to be a whole heck of a lot worse than that drill sergeant yelling at you. And you're not going to like it and react to it. And that's what our Lord was preparing them for. As a drill sergeant, he's saying, Look, you're about to go out as sheep amongst wolves. You better start learning some of these things I've been teaching you, or you're not going to be able to handle it. You better start learning these things, because the first time somebody criticizes you, you're going to be willing to compromise. And he's saying, Don't do it. And he's telling them exactly what's going to happen. He's saying, have discernment, because if, he, if they have discernment, you see, they could get sucked into a situation and get in all types of trouble because the religious people would put their thumb over them and say, do this, do that, and do the other thing. And the Apostle Paul got in trouble in that way because James got a hold of him when James was out of fellowship and said, all right, you're going to go to the Jews, and since you're going to the Jews, you better follow my rules. You better do it this way and that way. And if you don't do it this way and that way, you will fail. And the Apostle Paul caved to it. And when he caved, that's when the Apostle Paul failed. And, well, he's trying to tell them, look, it's going to be rough, folks. It's going to be rough for us when we're growing in grace and in knowledge. And people are going to attack us. And they're going to talk about us. 
They might even make fun of us, but it doesn't matter. You are as sheep going amidst wolves, and you will be brought before governors. And in those days, it would be Roman governors because Rome owned Israel. And you will be brought before Roman governors and kings, and those would be client kings. And these would be kings who represented SPQR, Sonatus Populus K. Romanus, the Roman Empire. And they would be kings like Herod. And remember, Herod tried to kill Christ right when he was born. At least he might have been one or two, and he, he just wiped out every young man under the age of two. On account of me, and you will be brought before Roman governors and kings on account of me, as a witness to them and the Gentiles. Now, when you're per- persecuted because of doctrine, then you become a witness. When, you become, when you're persecuted because uh, you love the word of God and others hate you for it, you become a witness, not only to others who might see you handle that pressure very well, but you become a witness in the angelic realm. And angels peer down, as it says in, the Hebrew, in, Hebrew, in the Hebrew, in the book in the Bible, they crane their necks, and they look down, and they observe you. And when they see you handling the criticism, when they see you handling uh, people getting all over you because you're doing the right thing, well, you become a witness, not only to those who uh, those around you as far as, far as far as humans go, but also in the angelic realm. And you become a witness in the angelic conflict. A tremendous thing, an invisible thing. Something that we can't see, but something that definitely occurs. 1019, whenever they hand you over, do not be worried about how to speak or what to say, for what you should say will be given to you at that time. That means at that very moment. They're criticizing you. You're standing up before the Sanhedrin, Jews, and you're standing up before them and they're saying, I saw you the other day drink wine with this man named Jesus. I saw you the other day hanging around with prostitutes. Now how can you uh, say you're a communicator of the word when you're doing stuff like that? And what our Lord says is, don't worry about that when they do that. Because when they do, God the Holy Spirit will bring to your memory exactly what to say. And you'll rip them, them to shreds with your tongue. And that's what he says, not with their fist. A pastor or no one who communicates doctrine is to be a striker of persons. Now, that was something that my pastor had to learn. He was weak in that area, very hot-headed sometimes. But he learned it once he started to grow up. You just can't take somebody out in a parking lot because they don't agree with you and beat the living tar out of them. You just can't do it, even though you're, he was a tough man. And you can't be a striker of persons, but you can say these things and you can tell them what they need to hear with your tongue. And that's what he's telling them. For it is not you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Now, this has to do with the filling of God, the Holy Spirit that had already been offered to them. We studied that earlier, but it will be given to them on the day of Pentecost. And at this point, when they, the Holy Spirit will bring to their memory exactly what to say. And we'll see in the book of Acts when we start studying that. And it coincides very well with Matthew. Because in the book of Acts, our Lord will be gone and residing in heaven at that point, And they'll be left down here to uh, do the work. And they'll be going out to the harvest, as it were, and giving the gospel. And people will uh, take them before. This is almost like a, a prophecy of our Lord to the disciples. Right now, they wouldn't be able to handle any of that. And we note that from Peter, who denied the Lord three times because he got under a little pressure. They weren't prepared yet for all of this. But he's uh, teaching them and saying, you're not prepared now, you will be later, and this is how you should function. And God the Holy Spirit will bring all of these things to their memory, all the things that Christ had taught them in doctrine. Right now, they don't have the filling of God the Holy Spirit. They're not retaining too much of these things. But when they receive the filling of God the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, they're going to start remembering the things the Lord said, just as Matthew did, and wrote them down. You know, Matthew didn't write what happened right then. He wrote it later. And you say, how could somebody remember 10, 15 years later exactly what happened? The Holy Spirit, that's how. And that's exactly what happened in the case of Matthew. And this is what's going to happen in the case of all of them except for Judas Iscariot. Then in 1021, 
brother will hand over brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. One of the most famous events in history was when uh, China went communist. And there were people over here in our State Department who didn't have any sense. And they said, the Chinese people will never go communist because they have such a strong family unit. Well, that would be something that, well, that's kind of smart thinking. Usually countries with strong family units aren't going to fall apart that easily under communist threat. But the communists came along and they turned their own children against their parents. And their parents might run a successful business. And Mao Zedong would get up and say, no, you cannot make profit. It's not part of communism. If you make a profit, well, you need to tell on your parents. And they would go to school and they would educate them and say, let the school authorities know everything your parents are doing. And then uh, once you do that, well, son or daughter will turn against father and mother, destroying the authority structure of the family. And it's happening today in our country. Well, they'll get you to go into school, and even though marijuana is a sin, even though it's illegal, there's been times in some schools where they have uh, uh, unwittingly uh, made the children say, do your parents, have you ever seen your parents smoking marijuana? And the children will write an essay and say, yes, And it's happened in this country. Now, it happened a lot. Now, you don't do that. And and this is why a lot of times you might be going to high school. They're going to tell you, write about your family. Write about this and that. And they'll want you to write personal things. Well, you write about them because they tell you to, but you don't have to get personal. But they want to know your family life. Everything everything concerning, well, it's part of the uh, satanic world. It happens in every country, including ours. But it happened in China, as I was saying. It was a great example. Because the Chinese, we said, the Chinese children will never turn against their parents. And the children would actually turn against them and actually order the executioner to execute their family members. And it even happened the other way around, where mother and father would order their child to be executed because they didn't follow communism exactly like Mao Zedong wanted it to be followed. Now, this is, that is satanic. It's part of a satanic system. And what our Lord is saying is, you're living in a world where there is a satanic system. And we are still today living in that same world. And so what occurs is, brother will hand over brother to death and a father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. Happened in China. Now this is a reference in 1021 to the tribulation. And remember the tribulation is seven years of horrendous activity in which all restraint is taken away. There'll be no restraint because we are believers and all of us will be taken to heaven. Remember, the Lord will come with a shout with the voice of the archangel and all those who are dead in Christ will rise, and then those who remain will be caught up together with him in the clouds, and so shall we be with the Lord forever. That begins the tribulation. We're gone. We don't live through that, and we can thank God for it. But at that point, there'll be no believers on the earth, no pivot, no nothing, and people will, well, it's going to create an even greater chasm between the cosmic system and the divine dinosphere or what we will call the unique spiritual life. And they'll have a different one in the tribulation based on the faith rest drill. And uh, the unbelievers are going to become very hostile toward any believers that rise up in the tribulation. And the fact is there will be in the tribulation a mother and father who's believed in Christ but their teenage child has not And the teenager turns them over to the authorities and they are killed. Kills his own parents. Or the parents. Now this is even weirder, but as the verse says, this is what happens. Parents usually love their children very much. But in this case, in the tribulation, there's such a satanic battle that the parents will not believe in Christ. Their teenage children will. And they will go up to the authorities and say, my son is an idiot. He's believed in Christ. And they'll kill him. And they won't even care. And this is what occurs. And he's preparing them, even though it's not going to be that bad for them because they won't go through the tribulation either. He's preparing them for hatred. There's going to be hatred between you because you love the truth and they love the lie. 
and people who love the lie will hate you for loving the truth and they will try to destroy you. And it splits families apart and we'll see that in probably a few moments. Then in 1022, and you will be hated by all on account of my name, but the one who endures to the end will survive. Now, this, this isn't a prerequisite for salvation. You don't have to endure to be saved. You have to believe in Christ to be saved. But you must endure under these hardships to not face the sin face to face with death. Because we have a, really two choices as believers. One, we can make a choice to say, nah, I don't care for the word. I'm not going to listen anymore. And if you make that choice, that means you'll go under divine discipline which is harsher than going through testing. And, or you could say to yourself, yeah, I'm going to stick with the Word of God and endure these tests. Now remember, a test, God will not give you more than you can bear. So when you're tested, you, you can handle it. But when you're punished, you can't. Because when God pun be not deceived, whatever a person sows, that will he also reap. And therefore, we cannot uh, think that we'll get away with anything in life including neglecting or rejecting the Word of God. It doesn't work that way. And you might say it's too hard to go down the path of learning the Word of God. Well, that's your choice. But remember, the Lord said, my yoke is light. It's not hard to learn the Word of God. We follow the protocol. He had the prototype. It was light for him. It's lighter for us. So, continuing here, uh, in 10:23, whenever they persecute you, that is for the truth, whenever they persecute you in one place, you see he's instructing the disciples. He's telling them what to do. They've just gone to a place and they've taught the word of God and they're being per per uh, persecuted. And the Lord says, whenever they persecute you in one place, get out and go to another. Don't hang around. If they don't have positive volition, get out. Go to another place. Someone is out there who is going to be receptive. I, for I tell you the truth. You will not finish going through all the cities and towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. And what he's saying is, look, you're going to get persecuted everywhere because you're going to hop from town to town giving the gospel and giving the message and they're going to persecute you. And they're going to persecute you so much you won't even get to go through all the towns and cities before the Lord comes. This is a reference to the tribulation, of course. And the Lord comes, this is the second advent, not the one where he comes in the air to receive us, but the one where he actually comes down to the Mount of Olives and splits the mountain in two and there's a huge earthquake. And then he destroys all the unbelievers and the streets run with blood, waist high, neck high, all the way up to the horse's bridle because he's destroyed all the unbelievers and there will be many of them. And what he's saying to them is, you see, they're still living as if they're in the age of Israel and he's saying, look, uh, there's a tribulation coming and there will be and it's been interrupted by the church age. We don't know when it's going to occur. It's not for us to know, but we can take application from it. So the believers in the tribulation will live under the same type of spiritual life that the disciples did right then. The faith rest drill, that's what they used. The faith rest drill in four categories. So this is a reference to enduring to the end of the tribulation. So it could be applied right then. For the disciples too would go through severe testing. And remember, Peter is going to die a martyr. He's going to die upside down on a cross. And the, the, uh, this is part of biblical history. It's not given to us in scripture, but part of biblical history says Peter said he wanted to be hung upside down because he didn't want to be hung the same way our Lord was, out of respect. And that's part of, of biblical history. It's part of church history. And it, it did happen that way. And so he hung upside down on a cross and died, an old man. They hung an old man on a cross. So imagine the severe testing he would have to go through but he loved the word of God so much he didn't care and Peter got so feeble in his old age that people had to carry him around same with same with John but he would still give the gospel and he would still give it like my pastor he was so feeble he could barely walk but uh, he did it until he lost his mind his memory he didn't lose his mind he lost his memory and he can't do it anymore well, Peter did the same thing, and he got so old, and they still hung him upside down on the cross. You'd think somebody would have a little compassion for an old man. They didn't. 
That's how vitriolic the cosmic system is. And it's the same today. Now, we live in a civilization in which these things are held off and tempered a bit because we're a client nation. But we're heading in that direction. Why else would 48.5% uh, of the people vote against an excellent man to be president? Other than the fact that he's a Christian. And he is a Christian. I don't know where he is spiritually. It's none of my business, but I know he's a Christian. And when you're at war, you support the man in power. And you might not agree with everything he does, but you stick by him. That's part of a principle of uh, understanding that we live in a client nation. And if we all bicker about everything he does, we'll lose the war. But that's the way we do it because we've, be we've gone degenerate. We've gone away from the word. And people stuck behind Roosevelt. Now, I didn't like Roosevelt as a president seeing some of the things that he did. But he was in the middle of a war and we stuck behind him. And we should stick behind our president no matter who he is. And if they had elected John Kerry, it'd be hard, but I'd stick behind the man during a war and say he's my president. Now, he might start doing something so stupid I'd talk about it, but that'd be my fault. We're supposed to uh, pray for the people in the land, not be a hindrance to them. And so then in uh, 1024... Well, let me continue. Whenever they persecute you in one place, get out and go to another. I tell you the truth. You'll not finish going through all the cities and towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A reference to the tribulation in which uh, the, the people will be evangelizing and they won't even get to finish before the Lord comes because they'll be so negative. Nobody's going to want to hear it anyway. So the Lord's just going to come down and wipe them out all in one day. And we talk about the Lord as uh, someone of peace. And liberals like to bring up the Lord and say, uh, the Lord teaches peace. Well, when necessary, the Lord wipes out the enemy. And in the tribulation, he's going to come down and wipe out the enemy. The enemy will be all the unbelievers. A disciple in 1024 is not above the teacher, nor a slave above his master. Now, this is a principle of authority, something that's very simple, something that might be hard for us in our culture to understand, but a student is not above his teacher. The teacher is the one in authority, whether the teacher's right or whether the teacher's wrong. And when you go to school and you don't like the teacher, they're still in authority over you, and you have to sit there quietly. I, can't, I had a teacher one time. He was such an idiot. I mean, this man, he was awful because he told us one night or one day to go home and write a 10-point essay on what's wrong with America and how we can fix it. Well, I said, all right, I can do that. And he said, make it your opinion. And I said, well, it's my opinion. I'll write 10 reasons down. Wish I had the writing with me today to share with you, but it had a lot to do with God and how people need to get with the Word of God. And the next day, I got the report back. Most of the pe half the people in the class didn't even bother to do it. The other people threw something together like the environment's going bad, we're going to choke to death. All the stuff he wanted to hear just regurgitated his junk. But when he got to mine, he, he looked at it. He knew he couldn't have failed me on it because I did it. Most people didn't. But I get it back, and I had a 90. And I said, hey, uh, why don't I get a 90? I, mean, I did it just the way you said. These are my opinions. How can you uh, give me a 90 when I did what you said and they're my opinions? Whether you think they're right or wrong, they're my opinion. And he said, well, you mentioned God an awful lot in that. A teacher in high school told me this. Now, I could have flew off the handle and chewed him out or whatever, but he was my authority. So I said, whatever, I'll take the 90. I wasn't going to make a big deal out of it. He was the authority and I didn't want to do that. Now, I could have took it to the principal, and that would have been fine because he was out of line. But what happened was one of the girls overheard our conversation, and she happened to be a Christian. And she said, well, let me read that. And I let her read it, and she started to say, that's right. This is right. And then other people started to read it, and they said, that's right. It humiliated the man. He was humiliated by teenagers. Well, sometimes that occurs. When uh, older people get so sealed in their conscience, they, uh, they don't even want to hear the mention of God. So then he kind of backed off and said, well, son, uh, maybe you need to be a pastor someday. <laughs> That's exactly what I did right there. I laughed at him. I said, <laughs> I'm not going to be a pastor. I laughed at him just like that. 
Now look, here I am. He may have had a little more wisdom than I thought, unknowingly, or either that or he's involved in the satanic world or something. It's kind of freaky. But that's the way it went. And you'll have teachers you don't agree with. And you're going to have teachers you don't like. And they're going to say something that really ticks you off. They're your authority. You still function under their authority. And the same holds true for communicators of doctrine and everything else. Everything in, We have authority systems set up by God. God put the police officer in authority over us for a good reason. If there were no police, well, people would be running into each other at red lights all the time. Just run right through them. There's no police. They're not going to stop me. Or they would do 150 down the highway and, and stuff like that. My wife looks ashamed. She must try to do that. But the... Uh, <laughs> The police are there for a reason. Authority is there for a reason, and it's there to protect our freedom. And the same holds true for the communication, the gift of communication. So a disciple is not above the teacher. That is, a disciple means student, by the way. The student is not above the teacher. And so long as you sit in front of me, you are my student. Now, you can say, I don't like it, and walk out, and then not be my student anymore. Then you have no, I have no authority over you. But when you come in and sit down, you are acting as a student. So a disciple is a student is not above the teacher, nor a slave above his master. Now that really brings it home because uh, slavery is really a social evil. And, and none of us would want to be a slave, and it really is an evil. Yet the Apostle Paul makes it clear, if you're under the state of slavery, stay there until you can find your freedom. And if they offer you freedom, get out, of course, he says. But if you end up a slave, well, stay there until God opens a way for you to get out of it. And we all have to function under authority. And thank God we don't have slavery today. So there is a principle of authority here. And there's also an a fortiori principle here. And that is with greater reason. And what he's trying to tell them is, look, I've been your teacher for however long he's been teaching them. And I'm telling you to go out and teach them the same things I've been teaching them. And he says, well, now when you go out and teach the same things that I'm teaching them, since you're my student and you're not above me, what makes you think that you're going to be immune to criticism? That's what he's saying. He's saying with stronger reason. If I'm the leader of you and I'm criticized, it stands with stronger reason you too are going to be criticized. And he continues with this in 1025. It is enough for the disciple, that is the student, to be like his teacher. In other words, hey, it's good enough. If you've been taught under a wonderful Bible teacher and you're just like him, guess what? It's good enough. If you've been under Jesus Christ and he's been teaching you and you've been learning the word of God under Jesus Christ, guess what? You're doing good enough. And he's actually complimenting here. He's saying, look, you're going to go out there and be just like me when you go out and teach. And guess what? That's good enough. It means you're doing your job. So it is good enough for the disciple to become like his teacher. They were under the authority of Christ, and they were to give the gospel just as Christ did. They were to follow his lead, and they were to say, Lord, you gave the gospel this way. This is how they were to think in their minds because the Lord wasn't going to be with them much longer and he knew it and he was telling them, I'm not going to be here much longer. You're going to be left to uh, do the work for me. And what you need to do is uh, teach the gospel just as I have. And notice, I've been persecuted when I did it, so you too will be. And this is the point. And the slave like his master, since they have called the head of the house Beelzebul. What's Beelzebul mean? <laughs> excuse me, that's a reference to Satan. And actually, uh, what it really means is a prince of dung. Dung is human excrement. And what, what they would call Jesus is, they, they would say, you're Beelzebub, you're from Satan. In other words, you are the prince of dung. How much more will they defame the members of his household? You've believed in Christ, you're a member of his household. And you disciples are going to go out and teach these things. So guess what? If they called me the prince of dung, then with stronger reason, what are you? Dung. He's the prince of dung and they're the dung. And that's how, they, that's how he described it to them. And he says, this is how you're going to be treated. And this is how it's going to be 
but you got to take heart. In other words, you got to use the faith rest drill. You got to keep going. And this is what he says in 1026. Do not be afraid of them. There is nothing hidden that will not be revealed. In other words, they try to obscure the gospel through religion. They try to obscure the gospel by adding things to the gospel. Remember, the gospel is everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. They add to it and say, no, nah, that's not enough. Invite Christ into your heart. Or no, that's not enough. Uh, you make Christ Lord of all and then you'll be saved. But scripture says, no, believe in Christ. It says it over and over again. John 3:15, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. John 3:18, he who believes in him is not judged, but he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the only name of the unique uh, son of God. And there are several others. I've given them enough. I'm not going to give them again. But that's the way of salvation. And the religious people obscure it by adding things to it. And so he's saying, look, you're going to go out and you give the gospel straight. People are going to ostracize you. And then he goes on to instruct them more in 1027. What I keep telling you in isolation, speak openly about. And what is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the housetops. What he's telling them is, don't be intimidated. He's saying, mm -mm. people are going to say all sorts of things about you. People are going to tell you do this and do that. And what our Lord tells him here, don't be intimidated. And what I'm telling you here in secret, I want you to go out into the wolves and proclaim it from the housetops. They'll be ready to whip you. But keep on talking. Keep giving the gospel. Because while... Half the people might be ready to whip you. The other half might be receptive to what you're saying. And that may have happened a couple times here, such as when an, the prophet walked in. You see, that was, the large, that was the day we had the most people here. And God had that happen for a reason. Because when the prophet, the guy, he said he was a prophet, he's not. And he didn't know the gospel from straight up and straight down, probably wasn't even saved. I'm not here to judge him on that. But I knew we needed to hear the gospel anyway. And a whole bunch of other people here may have needed to hear it. And so when they sat down there, well, I got a little fired up. I wasn't going to be intimidated by their holiness. So I said, uh, you need to believe in Christ. You think you're here because you're all holy and you think you're going to heaven because of that and you're not. You need to believe in Christ. And pointed at him, even looked at him, even leaned up and looked in his face that was breaking out in hives. But there were people in the back, people who had never been here before. They may have never heard the gospel that straight before in their life. And that might have been the one time they heard it just clear enough to where they would believe. So you can't be intimidated. And the religious people would intimidate the Lord and get in front of him. And you know what he would say as he's been saving before? He says, you think you're good. You think you're going to heaven because you're so good, because of your good works. You're all going to hell. And when he would tell them that, well, other people were listening as well. And they would start to think and say, hmm, I've never heard anything like this. <coughs> then he'd give the gospel and they would say, this man speaks with authority. He knows what he's talking about. I believe in the Lord. And they would be saved. So he's telling them, he's preparing them for the ministry. And he's telling them, do not be intimidated. Do not be afraid of them. There's nothing hidden that won't be revealed. In other words, you're the ones going to go out and reveal the gospel. They can't hide it. You're going to reveal it and they can't hide it. And the truth about the word of God is going to get out no matter what. And nothing secret that will not become known He's going to let it be known. What I keep telling you in isolation, speak openly about. And what is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the housetops. Keep on talking. 1028. Never be afraid of those who can kill the body. Their lives will be threatened all the time. Never be afraid of those who can kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. Instead, fear him who is able to ruin both soul and body in hell. In other words, you've been saved. There's no reason for you to be scared of death. People are going to try to intimidate you by saying, I will kill you. And in fact, some of them will get the chance to kill you like they did Peter. Now, maybe not in our cases. I'm talking about the disciples. He was teaching to them. And he was saying, look, these people are going to hate you so much, they're going to try to kill you. But so what? Don't fear them. 
hang on that cross, hang on that cross upside down, and go straight to heaven when you die, and you'll have lots of rewards. So don't even worry about it. Take it as an honor, a badge of honor. Don't shrink away. Don't be intimidated. Never be afraid. 1029. Aren't two sparrows sold for an Assyrian? Now this is a small Roman copper coin that's worth about a half hour's wage in those days. One sixteenth of a denarius. And that is how much it was. Not much, in other words. Half hour's wage. Most people in Israel didn't get paid very much. They were very poor people by this time because they were under severe punishment. And God was trying to wake them up, so they were under poverty. And God will take this country and put it under poverty if that's what it takes to wake us up. And we had the lights out for a little while. Well, just think. What if they were out for three months? What would the people be in? Poverty. They wouldn't be able to watch their favorite show. They wouldn't be able to, well, they would probably have to go get things from the garden because everything in the grocery stores would rot. And we'd have to do canned goods and drink water and not have any of the necessities that we thought were necessities but really weren't. They were luxuries. And guess what? When you don't have nothing to do, they're going to get bored. And, the, and maybe instead of making entertainment their God, they'll say, I'll walk into a church today. Something's gone wrong. And that is, uh, that is exactly what occurs. And this is what is occurring in Israel. They're in poverty, and a, a half hour's wages is nothing for the Israelites. It's definitely nothing for a Roman. They looked at the Israelites as a pitifully poor and they tried to help them out all they could but they were so rebellious they were actually when they were under the fourth cycle of discipline the Romans were kind to the Jews they would rebuild their cities give them food and lavish them with things they would have never otherwise had yet they despised it anyway they were never happy no matter what that's because they were under the fourth cycle so aren't two sparrows sold for an Assyrian? Of course they are. And yet none, not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. In other words, these birds, these sparrows, they're worth hardly nothing. They're worth a half hour's wages. And God takes care of them. And he knows when they fall to the earth. So how much more, with a fortiori, which means strong, with stronger reason, with stronger reason, how much more so is God going to take care of us? So anytime we catch ourselves worrying about money, which is a natural human condition, especially when the old sin nature gets involved and we worry about money and it starts to get low and we say, oh no, woe is me. Remember, his eye is on the sparrow. How much more will his eye be on you? And some of these tests we go through are so that we grow up, so that we learn to use the faith rest drill. And he's telling them, look before, as I told you in the last message, he said, don't even take your wallet. Don't take your wallet on your mission. Don't even bother bringing some extra clothing. Just bring yourselves and what you have on your back. Everything else will be provided. Don't worry. You see, he's trying to immediately orient them away from the details of life. Because they were, you know, most of these disciples were very wealthy before they hooked up with Jesus. I mean, really, they were. I mean, uh, Matthew, it says fisherman, really, uh, he was part of a, a great fishing enterprise. He had need of nothing. And, well, not Matthew, I'm talking about the others. Matthew was the tax collector, of course, and he was able to skim off the top from all the money and enrich himself. But when the Lord said, follow me, he dropped it all and followed him. Didn't even worry about the money. And it, he's preparing them for the ministry saying, look, sometimes you'll have plenty, sometimes you won't, you won't but that's the way it goes. And, and guess what? You're not going to fall to the ground apart from your father's will, no more than a sparrow will. So this come, what he's telling them is, look, Use the most basic thing that you have in your spiritual life outside of naming your sins to God and being filled with the Spirit. And that is the faith rest drill. And he's saying, look, you're going to have to start to claim some promises now. Yeah, I'm, you're, I'm about to leave you, and right now I'm going to help you out the best I can, but as soon as I go to the cross, I'm going to be gone. I won't be here for you anymore, but I'll leave behind the counsel, which is God the Holy Spirit, and he'll bring to your memory those things that you need, and you'll be able to apply some doctrine then. You're not doing too well now, but you will then, and you're going to be able to go out and handle these things. 
and you're going to need to learn something called the faith rest drill. You're going to need to learn how to rest in faith. And so he's telling them you need to learn some promises, just as we do, just as we need to know. First Peter 5, 7, cast all your care upon the Lord, for he cares for you. And any time you get in a tough spot, a tight situation, remember he cares for you. He cares for you more than a sparrow, and he knows when they fall, and he definitely cares for you more than that. And then in 1 Samuel 17, 47, the battle is the Lord's. And so you get in a battle with, a, usually it's with people, or maybe you're in a battle on the battlefield. Well, this is one that the uh, people in the military can claim. The battle is the Lord's. And just like the uh, guy, my pastor used to tell me about the guy in World War II who looked up, or he was either World War II or Vietnam, I can't remember which, it's not important, because he looked up at a sparrow and there were machine gun bullets going choom, 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 right by his head all the time. And he was a medic, and there were some people who were injured, and he saw that sparrow sitting on a limb, tweet, tweet, comfort, not even, didn't have a care in the world. And God the Father didn't let that sparrow fall to the ground with a bullet. And so he looked at that sparrow and said, you know, if his eye is on the sparrow, his eye is on me. So he got up and started jumping from foxhole to foxhole and getting people who were injured and bringing them back and helping them. And he ended up being a hero in the war. Why? Faith rest. He rested. He remembered a promise. He recalled scripture in a battle. And he could have just as easily said, the battle is the Lord's and jumped up like David did and went out and took care of things. Or in 1 Timothy 1, 7, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power. That's God the Holy Spirit. Power and of love. That's the integrity envelope, number 7 and number 8. And of a sound mind. And that sound mind has to do with the fact that the Bible doctrine stabilizes your soul. Philippians chapter 4, 6 and 7. Stop worrying about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding shall guard and garrison your hearts and minds, that is your stream of consciousness, in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4:19. But my God shall supply all you need according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. And what has uh, God given us? The most phenomenal spiritual life we could ever, ever have. Something far above and beyond what we could ever ask or think. Far above wealth. We might want wealth, natural human yearning to better yourself. But guess what? We have spiritual wealth. We have things that can uh, make us happy. We could be a billionaire and be unhappy. And do you think that, uh, well, I don't know uh, the man who owns Microsoft personally, Bill Gates, but I can tell you that if he doesn't have doctrine, he's miserable with his billions and billions of dollars. Miserable. Now, he might be an unbeliever, and if he's an unbeliever, he can have some happiness in enjoying his life and his wife and his money. But that's all he has. Now, if he's a believer and he's not with the word of God, he's in a spiritual conflict. And no matter how much money you make, you're going to be miserable. And you might know some wealthy people, I do, or semi-wealthy, not extraordinarily wealthy. And they are miserable. Money didn't make them happy. So we must latch on to the eternal wealth. Live our lives in the light of eternity. Eternity is a long time, lasts forever and ever and ever. And that's where the true wealth is, that never rusts, that never corrupts. But the wealth on this earth does get old, it does wear away. And we can be wealthy one moment and then be poor, but what's it matter if you have the word of God? And just like the country song says, never seen a hearse with a luggage rack, and that's true. Everything that you accumulate here on this earth you can't take it with you except doctrine. The Word of God is the only thing you can take with you into heaven. And if you put it into your souls, you're going to take it to heaven. And when you take it to heaven, you're going to get reward for it. And you're going to be the happiest person ever for eternity. 
Romans 8, 28. Now we know that to those who love God, all things work together for good to those who were called according to a predetermined plan. Romans 8, 31 and 32. If God be for us, who can be against us? He who spared not his own son, but delivered him up over to judgment for us all, how shall he not freely give us all things? Those all things have to do with spiritual things. This is a fortiori. This is with stronger reason. A fortiori, remember, is a Latin word, and it means with stronger reason. With stronger reason, if God supports us logistically, then with stronger reason, he'll, or if he died on the cross for us as a substitute, and he did, then with stronger reason, he'll give us everything else we need in life. And if you seek the kingdom of heaven first, then all these things will be added unto you. So we'll be provided for, nothing to worry about in that area. Psalm 16, 8, I have set the Lord continually before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. That's something the disciples could claim while they are going under testing because they can say, I'm not shaken. I'm not intimidated by these religious people. I'm giving them the gospel. And that comes with spiritual self-esteem. Psalms 27, 14. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. And you might want something right now. You might want a girlfriend right now. Wait for the Lord. He'll provide for that. No, I'm not telling you you can't go out and date unless your parents tell you you can't. If your mom says, no, you can't date till you're 18, you've got to follow her instructions. You're under her authority. But if she says, all right, son, you are 15 now. You can go out and uh, date for a limited time from 7 to 8 o'clock. You can go bowling with her or something. And they might limit you, and that is their prerogative. And I'm not saying that if your parents say you can go date, you can't go date. That's how you get to know people. And if you never date them, you're not going to know them. You might look at somebody in the church and say, man, they're gung-ho for doctrine, and get to know them and realize they're a loser. And we'll get to this principle in, in a moment because uh, what it says is uh, not all Israel is Israel. And that means not everyone in Israel was even a believer. Not everyone in Israel cared for the faith rest drill. Not, is, not all Israel is Israel. So just because somebody shows up at church all the time doesn't mean their mental attitude is in the right place. And I understand that full well. But... Uh, it's all, it, it, but as long as they come and listen, well, that's an encouragement because they have a chance all the time to straighten out. But you might date somebody who you say, wow, they're gung-ho, and then you realize, no, they're not. It was all a, a front, a phony type thing, and it might have been, but then you just find someone else to date, and it's uh, something that you do. And I've never, I, I got the question the other day, not to embarrass anyone, but you don't know who it was anyway. I got the question the other day, and it said, and they said, uh, you told me to wait on the Lord for my right partner. Does that mean I can't date? Of course, no, you can date. I never implied you couldn't date. It just means that uh, be careful in it and don't uh, let your hormones go nuts because uh, fornication is a sin, of course. But uh, you can date, of course, and have a social life and do all of those normal things, and that's how you get to know people. And you might get to know someone who you thought would never be positive, and suddenly they go positive, and then uh, that would be a person to marry right there, someone growing in grace. But even then, it's not foolproof, and I've told you that. Nothing in marriage is foolproof, because you might marry someone who is positive starting out, and they say, I love the Word of God, I love going to church. And then they get strangled by something and they uh, drift away from it. And you're the only one left chugging along. Well, you, you made the choice. You didn't know what was going to happen, but you got to stick it out. You got to have that staying power. And why can't you? Jesus Christ had the staying power on the cross. You can have the staying power in relationships. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23 is one of uh, my favorite. Uh, because of its poetic value and other things. Also, Laments 320, Lamentations 3.22 and 3.23 was written to a generation that had fallen under the fifth cycle of discipline. And so this is a comfort to those who are going under slavery. And this is what it says. The Lord's loving kindness never cease. Your country's been decimated, but the Lord's loving kindness never cease. His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. 
that is great is God's faithfulness. And even though tears may endure for the night, joy shall come in the morning. And that means even though you've been out of fellowship and incarnality, you've rebounded and joy will come in the morning. So all of these promises are promises we need to claim. The same promises the apostles, who are soon to be apostles, need to start claiming because there's going to be a hard road ahead for any of us growing in grace. But it's a lot easier than those who decide not to. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to study this portion of the word. May we, stro may we grow stronger in, in faith. And may we learn to utilize more and more the faith rest drill. And may we come to recognize grace orientation in order that we can be gracious toward others. And let us recognize the power of the word of God. And let us always remember that our Lord did not come to bring peace, but to divide. So we must always be keenly aware of the importance of doctrine so as not to be led astray. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.